So we, we would have heard right at the beginning of the webinar series about dementia being an umbrella term um, for there's many different types of, of uh, dementia. So it's an umbrella term um, and there's many different causes of dementia. And dementia can be defined as a memory or thinking difficulty, which causes impairment in daily activities. Uh, it's not a normal part of the aging process and Alzheimer's disease is one of the most common causes of dementia. And you would have heard for people who, who uh, came to the earlier webinars, uh, you would have heard about this idea of the accumulation of toxic proteins in the brain, which can cause Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. And so the idea of bar, uh, biomarkers as well um, of Alzheimer's disease, what's interesting is we can see these biomarkers 15, you know, up to 15 to 25 years before the onset of clinical symptoms. So the kind of things that might be classed as biomarkers uh, would be proteins, these toxic proteins that we might see in someone's cerebrospinal fluid, for example, or on a PET scan, um, you can see uh, proteins in, in the brain on a PET scan. So that makes it very interesting in terms of the kind of research that many of our research members are involved in uh, investigating these, these biomarkers. So there's emerging evidence over the last number of years that dementia is preventable. So this is really good news. I suppose, you know, a lot of people have been holding out for, you know, magic cure for dementia. So the fact that dementia is potentially preventable is, is really good news because there's things that we can all do throughout our life course to uh, reduce our risk of developing dementia. So we talked earlier in the webinar series about this idea of cognitive reserve, um, which is like a, a buffer or a reserve that we can build up, uh, which can prevent brain disease. And um, so there's certain elements of that that are not particularly, um, you know, we don't, might not have a lot of control over them. For example, the number of years of education that we got a, as a child, um, the type of job we do, how cognitively stimulating that is, um, but there are other factors, what we call lifestyle factors, that we can all you know, be aware of and, and try and, um, uh, I suppose, manage throughout our, our life course. So the research tells us that there's a potential to prevent 40% of dementias over the life course. That's a really significant number. And there's uh, the latest research, which uh, was updated in 2020, so it's very, very recent. Um, talked about 12 modifiable risk factors, which I'll show you now in terms of, uh, that are particularly important in relation to dementia prevention. And the good news is, although sometimes we don't have a lot of control maybe over the number of years of education that we've had, it's never too early and never too late to think about reducing our dementia risk. So it could be that we, you know, make sure that children uh, get proper education. Uh, for adults, maybe people want to, you know, think about going back to uh, further education later in life. Um, and then again, all, all those uh, lifestyle factors, which I'll show you now, um, there's, there's always something that we can do to prevent our, our risk of, of dementia. And again, during the webinar series, we heard this idea of a healthy heart equals a healthy brain. So it's a nice way of, I suppose, thinking about our brain health, uh, because we're, we're very aware there's been a lot of research and um, I suppose, uh, public health communication around how to keep a healthy heart. So we, we know a lot of the things that we should be doing to, to keep our hearts healthy. So a lot of that is relevant to keeping our brains healthy as well. So it's not necessarily rocket science, what we have to do. Um, so this is the 2020 research paper from the Lancet Commission, um, which highlighted, you can see on the right there, uh, the modifiable risk factors that we can focus on during our, our lives. So. Uh, those factors can account for up to 40% of dementia cases. So the kind of things we're talking about are hearing loss, high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, smoking, sedentary lifestyle, depression, social isolation, low education, head injury, excess alcohol and air pollution. So then during the webinar series, we would have heard from uh, Dr. Catherine Hughes from Ulster University, who talked about nutrition and diet in relation to preventing dementia. Um, so nutrition plays a key role in prevention. And she talked about the importance of particular nutrients for brain health. So that included omega-3 fatty acids, polyphenols, vitamin D, and some limited evidence for the benefit of vitamin C and vitamin E. Um, she also talked about the fact that there's strong scientific evidence linking B vitamins, particularly folic acid and B12, with slower rates of memory decline and reduced dementia risk. 
Um, she talked about the importance of uh, the Mediterranean diet, which is associated with better memory and thinking, slower rate of cognitive decline and reduced risk of dementia. And um, so the Mediterranean diet would be a high intake of fruit, vegetables, nuts and olive oils, a moderate intake of fish and alcohol and low intake of dairy and meat products. And so we also talked about the MIND diet, which is a new and more recently developed diet. And it combines the Mediterranean diet with the DASH diet, which is an eating plan to control high blood pressure. So research indicates that the MIND diet reduces the risk of developing dementia. So all really good news in terms of uh, what we can do to uh, look after our brain health. And uh, Catherine also mentioned that nutrition obviously influences other risk factors for dementia, such as obesity, hypertension, diabetes, and cholesterol. So by, by eating healthily, we're you know, um, having this positive impact on our, our lives on many different levels. In terms of what does healthy eating look like? So uh, Catherine would have shown us the healthy eating food pyramid, which we're probably all familiar with, even from, from school days. It's obviously changed over the years. So uh, you can access that through healthyireland.ie. And basically foods at the top of the pyramid, we should be eating uh, more often. Sorry, that should actually be uh, the bottom of the period, uh, pyramid. I just realized that, uh, so it's all the, I think we know anyway, it's all the fruits and vegetables, not all the, the fatty, sugary snacks that we should be eating. So, um, so all the, the healthy stuff at the bottom, we should be eating more of and less of the, the uh, less healthy stuff at the top. Um, and hydration is also important uh, for brain health. So then we would have heard from Dr. Annalisa Setti in UCC, who talked about a community-led community project that she was involved in called Step Up to Your Health. And this is an example of what we call citizen science, where a group of senior citizens actually approached the researchers in UCC and said, we're interested in, in doing a study looking at activity levels and, um, and, and our health. So it was a group called Young at Heart in Cork and they wanted to uh, use an activity tracker to improve uh, activity levels in the group. So they set up, uh, working with the researchers in Cork, uh, they set up a six week walking program, uh, which included a booklet where uh, the participants wrote down their, you know, their progress and their thoughts, etc. And then they all used an activity tracker as well. So some things that they learned from that project was that we need to keep challenging ourselves and novelty is good as well. So for example, learning how to use a tracker, an activity tracker, if we've never done that, that's all good for the brain. Something new, something challenging, something novel. Uh, activity, obviously the actual walking um, and the socializing on the walks is all really important. Um, practicing any new skill that we, that we uh, pick up and self-compassion they mentioned as well as being important, not beating yourself up if you don't achieve what you set out to achieve in a particular day. Um, they also found that there was very positive benefits from nature, um, particularly to restore our attention and to feel more vital and to find meaning in our activities. Um, but we, and they made the point that it's important to pay attention to nature. So if you're out walking, maybe to take a note of the sound of the birds singing or the river running next to you or whatever it is. So that's particularly good for your brain. And then they also talked about um, the need to uh, challenge our negative perceptions of aging, our own and society's negative perceptions of aging. And Fergus Fawcett from UCC talked about how those negative perceptions can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, and it can actually affect your cognition. Um, so if you believe that you're not going to be as, as uh, sharp or your memory isn't going to be as good when you get older, then when you do get older, often that can actually happen. It's, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy, if you like. So then we heard from uh, Dr. Michelle Kelly uh, about cognitive stimulation therapy and cognitive rehabilitation. So these interventions are designed for people in the earlier stages of dementia and they're evidence-based, which means that there's a strong body of evidence to show that the interventions work, which is good news. And they're, uh, they've been, I suppose, become more popular in Ireland over the last, last number of years. So cognitive stimulation therapy is a group intervention for people with mild to moderate dementia and sessions provide cognitive stimulation around thinking and memory across different themes. And it also provides a social environment, which is very important uh, in terms of brain health as well. Cognitive rehabilitation then, it's not the group format, it's more of a one-to-one -one intervention and it's goal-based where the person taking part in the intervention will 
uh, agree goals with the therapist and often there's a carer involved as well and um, the therapist then develops an intervention plan based around the goals that the person uh, wants to work on for example remembering um, somebody's grandchildren's names so then we heard from Dr. Robert Whelan on neuro neuroimaging and brain health. And he was talking about how neuroimaging is very useful in terms of research. Uh, for example, looking at MRI scans and PET scans. Um, so the, the kind of research that Rob and, and his, um, his lab are, are working on, they're often focused on uh, people who aren't necessarily showing symptoms of dementia, um, but there's changes going on in their brain, um, which, as I mentioned earlier, can happen 15 to 25 years before any clinical symptoms. So it's, it's interesting to, to look at brain scans from people who are, are healthy, uh, but there may be changes going on in the brain, and it's an inter interesting area of research. Uh, Rob talked about a brain age score, so the fact that chronologically we might be a certain age, but our, act our brain might be older or younger than that based on um, he explained it's, it's an algorithm basically um, where lots of uh, brain scans have been fed into a computer and uh, we, we have this kind of average age, if you like, of, of a brain and, you know, depending on um, what the, the brain scan is, is showing. I hope I've done that justice, Rob, in terms of explaining something like that. Um, so uh, Rob talked about uh, why, why, why do we even do this? It's not just for, for the fun of it, it's actually... Uh, we can come up with these what's called brain pad scores, so um, a brain predicted age difference. So it's the difference between what we are chronologically in age versus what the computer is telling us our brain actually looks like. So is it looking like a younger brain or an older brain? And so Rob talked about ways to keep our brain young. So this is, this is very, uh, I suppose, hopeful in terms of uh, the kind of things that we can do to keep our, our brains young. So keep learning and keep moving. And we've heard that from lots of speakers during the, the Brain Health series. Um, and there was just some interesting, as was little uh, bits of research there, one additional flight of stairs climb per day related to a decreased predictive brain age by seven months. So uh, that kind of movement and, and cardiovascular health uh, is, is really important. Uh, singing and playing music is good for our brains and particularly if you're an amateur musician. So that was all good news and also good news for meditators. Um, so some research has found that, that at the age of 50, brains of meditators had brain pad scores seven and a half years younger than those of controls. Uh, Rob also talked about uh, the concept of precision aging, which is uh, comes under that overall umbrella term precision medicine, which some people might have heard of. Um, so the idea is that in the future, with advances in technology, we might be able to look at a person's genetic history and their individual brain through brain scans and then individualize an intervention for that person. So it's, it's uh, getting uh, into more individual uh, precision medicine. And neuroimaging has the potential for accurate and early identification of poor brain health, uh, which may lead to earlier and better treatments, ultimately improving quality of life. So again, because uh, the kind of research that Rob is doing is looking at people uh, at a much earlier stage before they develop uh, clinical symptoms, we can start interventions at an earlier stage, which would be uh, really good. And then our last speaker, which was just last Monday, was Dr. Ruth McCullough, uh, who's a physiotherapy lecturer in UCC. And Ruth talked about this idea of feeding the brain. Um, so the importance of keeping blood supply to the brain. So when we, uh, we all know that exercise is good for us. So I suppose Ruth I uh, was kind of lifting the bonnet a little bit in terms of, you know, why is it that exercise is so good for the brain? So it, it's literally feeding it with oxygen and nutrients. So it's, it's nice to, I suppose, think of exercise in that way. And she talked about, obviously, that happens when you're uh, exercising aerobically and it works the heart and blood vessels really well, which is all good for, for the brain. And she also talked about um, this uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor or BDNF which is, and I know Sabina Brennan would have mentioned it, that idea of almost like a fertilizer for the brain. And so it's a protein involved in brain growth and especially in the hippocampus area of the brain, which is associated with learning and memory. Um, so exercise has a, a, you know, increases the levels of BDNF in the brain, which is really positive. And research has found that people who habitually exercise, so on a daily basis, on a very regular basis, they have better memory. And that was research done with young and middle-aged individuals. 
Um, in terms of WHO recommendations for exercise, uh, we're talking about at least 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity, moderate intensity aerobic exercise. Um, so getting, getting the heart rate up. Um, Ruth also talked about, you know, in addition to more structured exercise, where we might say, right, I'm going for a walk now, or I'm going to the gym, or I'm going to play a game of tennis. There's also a lot of non-structured exercise that we can, uh, we're, 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 still, um, we're, we're still being active and keeping our brains healthy by all those other non-structured things we do, be it cleaning the house, gardening, walking to the bus stop, et cetera. So they all count, basically. Um, Ruth also talked about muscle strengthening activities, which are particularly important from the age of 40 to 50 onwards, and the recommendations to do them at least two days per week. And she also talked about uh, breaking up our sedentary activity. So every 30 minutes, stand up and walk for two to three minutes. This is what the research is, is uh, showing us uh, to keep the, uh, the brain flow going. So I suggest people on the webinar, maybe uh, when you've been listening for 30 minutes, maybe get up and stretch the legs and walk around and you can still listen to us, hopefully. It might make it a little bit more interesting. <laughs> um, so then Ruth talked about exercises to train the brain. So not just feeding the brain through exercise, but then training the brain. So uh, where exercise is challenging or complex, uh, you're actually really working the brain, obviously. And so she talked about examples of that would be yoga and Tai Chi, um, where there's skilled or motor training involved. It demands balance, it demands coordination, attention, ability to perceive your environment. So there's a lot going on. We, you know, we don't tend to think of that maybe if we're doing something gentle like yoga or Tai Chi, but actually your, your brain is, is working away as you're practicing um, those, those types of activities. Um, she also talks about, talked about increasing attentional demand to train your brain so if anyone who plays football or golf or tennis will know that you, you know you have to be very aware of what's going on you're keeping score you're um you're watching where your opponents are so there's a lot of activity going on in your brain which is all really good for you and then for people who maybe aren't as keen on on sports or team sports there's also things like dancing and gardening and um, lots of activities where you're physically moving but there's a lot of demand on your brain as well so something for everybody, and uh, Ruth talked about finding something that you enjoy, um, which I think we all know that's, we're much more motivated to, to uh, be involved in exercise if we're enjoying it. Uh, she talked about, you know, staying motivated, which we all know is, is a real challenge. Um, so changing, maybe looking at your mindset, instead of saying, I need to go for a walk, maybe I want to go for a walk. Uh, find what you like, uh, setting yourself goals, tracking your progress, uh, take, you know, breaking things down into bite-sized achievable chunks. And then this concept of a, an accountability buddy, which is exercising with a buddy. So you're more likely to get out the door on a maybe wet, cold night to maybe go for a walk if, if you have a friend waiting for you, for example. And then she also talked about the importance of rest and sleep. Uh, so moderate aerobic exercise increases the amount of deep sleep we get. So it's, it's benefiting us. Um, in terms of sleep as well and that gives our body the, the chance and our brain the chance to to rejuvenate okay so i'll just finish there with some useful websites and resources for people um, i put up the healthy ireland website uh, the alzheimer's society of ireland their website and national helpline uh, they have a brain health leaflet which is very good on their on their website the link is there um, there's the Understand Together public campaign led by the HSE. So that's uh, the aim of that is to reduce the stigma of dementia and to educate people around dementia. Uh, there's a Dementia Pathways website, which is uh, specifically for healthcare professionals. The Parkinson Association of Ireland, our own network. And as I said, you'll find the presentations for the webinar series under the resources tab and our YouTube channel where you'll find the recordings from the last seven sessions. And we also have a Twitter account if you, if you want to follow us on that. And that's the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland's leaflet, Brain Health Matters. So um, it, it gives you uh, five steps you can take to reduce your risk of dementia. So it's a nice little summary, I suppose, of a lot of what we've been talking about over the Brain Health series and, and today as well. Okay, so I'll um, start the panel discussion then. Uh, and what I'd like to do is to put a question to each of our panelists. So the first question I have is, what do you think are the most important messages 
from the webinar series. And I might ask Sean to kick off on that. Hi, uh, good morning, everybody. And thanks, Carol. That was, to be honest, that was a fantastic overview of everything. And uh, I think you've covered what were the most important messages from, from, uh, from certainly from uh, my perspective. I think there's a, there's a few, you know, what, what's, you know, one of the key messages is actually how well attended the webinar series has been and how much interest people have shown. I think it's reflective that people are becoming more aware of the concept of brain health. And a few years ago, people didn't talk about brain health. And even, you know, when I was coming through training in med school, a lot of our discussion around neurological illness and neurological uh, difficulties was about how irrecoverable neurological disease was, whereas actually that narrative has changed quite a bit over the last decade to where people have an expectation of recovery and an expectation that we can change the trajectory uh, of, of decline in a lot of neurological illness, including uh, in dementia. So I think that's that's an important piece. I think, uh, you know, the, the concept of dementia as a biological condition. So even though it's a biological condition with a, a profound social, cognitive and psychological impact. There is a biology underlying it the same as there is for heart disease, kidney disease, liver disease. And you know that acceptance and understanding by, by clinicians and the public that there is a biology under, you know, underlying it has meant that over the last 10 years, we, we've started to explore that biology an awful lot more than we would have um, you know, uh, before that. And that's, that's led to this concept whereby, as opposed to just looking at an increasing lifespan, and that's one of the great, that longevity dividend is a huge benefit for society. So we are living longer now, we're looking for health span. And one of those key things, in fact, when you survey people with regards to what they most fear as they grow older, around about the age of 40, it flips from cancer to dementia. And from the age of 40 onwards, the number one by a long distance as to what people fear most is actually dementia and diminishing cognition. So people are becoming engaged and energized about learning what they can do to prevent dementia, the information that 40% of it is, is preventable and that accumulating evidence around that. The fact that, you know, we can come back to it later on if people want to discuss it, that we may have new therapies and the role that they will play, understanding the, you know, you know the, the you know, things like the cognitive stimulation, how that can, how that can change, you know, our, you know, our brain function and, and the neuroimaging pieces and, you know, at a molecular level, how it, how it all interacts and fits together. I think those are, those are really, you know, um, key messages. And I suppose that the fact that we now also understand it's never too early and it's never too late. So there are, it, there is a life course you know, to these risk factors. Um, so there are things that we need to, as a society, be addressing, you know, really, really early stages, such as educational attainment and social equity, which will have a profound impact on the dementia risk. And then there are things that people can do at an individual level, even later in life. So it's never too late early to be doing some things and it's never too late as well. So I think those, you know, as well as all of those uh, things that you highlighted in your presentation, that, that's probably what, what I would see as the important messages. Okay, great. Thanks, Sean. Um, I might go to you, Rob, next um, for your thoughts on the important messages. Thanks very much, Carol, uh, and thanks to all the attendees. I think looking at the YouTube videos, the thing that struck me was the variety of approaches that were, that were brought to bear in this series. And I think that really emphasizes the point that there's multiple influences on brain health. I mean, all the way from nutrition to exercise, to, to cognitive things that you do, like doing the crossword, to social engagement, uh, and so on. And they all have a probably a quite small influence on their own, but when you add them all up, there's, there's certainly a good chance there that they can uh, work in a preventive sense. So I think if you look back at the modifiable risk factors from, that, from the 2020 paper, you know, there's multiple, there's 12 risk factors listed there. And I think, you know, if, if people could think about doing a little bit for each one of those, then that would be, you know, very helpful. So it's not, it's not one thing on its own. It's not just exercise. It's not just nutrition or, or trying to be cognitively stimulated. It, it's trying to do all those things a little bit. And, you know, each, each one of them will, will increase your odds or improve your odds uh, a little bit by themselves. Uh, and I think, you know, the other thing to bear in mind is that each one of these factors, even if, you know, even if you don't have such a good profile on one of the factors, these things are only uh, a risk factor or a probability that, 
that it doesn't necessarily mean anything if, if your brain scan doesn't look so great. So one of the things that I presented was this idea of cognitive reserve that if we look at a structural brain scan, you might have two people whose brain image looks the same, but they might have completely different cognitive profiles. And that might be down to something like uh, their kind of level of stimulation or the engagement, social engagement that they might have, that that might confer this cognitive reserve that might actually mean that they have quite good functioning, even, even though they have uh, some pathology there as well. So to remember that, even something like imaging that looks objective and, and clear, you know, in reality, there, there might be completely different outcomes depending on your lifestyle and these other factors as well. Yeah, great. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. And Michelle, I'll ask the same question of you, the, the key messages. Thanks, Carol. Yeah. And uh, thanks to, to Rob and Sean as well for those key points. And I guess I'm just going to sort of follow up and, and add to those a little bit, particularly around Sean's point that it's never too early and it's never too late. So really, uh, you know, from the point of view of it's never too late, the work that I would do would be around the interventions for people who have a diagnosis of dementia. So when we're talking about brain health, I think it is important to know that even after the diagnosis of dementia, it's still not too late to work on brain health. So, you know, an important point would be that in even in early stages of AD or other kinds of dementia, there's evidence that there's preservation of this kind of neural or cognitive plasticity. So really, that basically just means that experiences can still change the brain's structure in a positive way. And there's still capacity for new learning or relearning of information. So the person with dementia or who has mild cognitive impairment still has the capacity to learn new information and it's not too late. You know, they can still carry out cognitive tasks. They can still learn and practice routines. And these kinds of things are very beneficial. And similarly then, you know, all of the other kinds of, of you know, interventions, brain health interventions that we talked about throughout the, the webinar series, like exercise, healthy eating, these things still apply to the person with dementia. So I guess that's why these kinds of interventions like cognitive stimulation therapy and cognitive rehabilitation are so important because they're an opportunity for people to engage their brains and to stimulate their brains after the point of the diagnosis. Yeah. Um, for, for cognitive stimulation therapy, I guess that would be more suited to people with mild to moderate impairment and would focus more on general cognitive ability. So like it might improve language or communication scores, or it might improve a score on a, a, a general cognitive test. Whereas I think cognitive rehabilitation is much better suited to people with much more mild levels of impairment. So even just let's say somebody who could be worried about their memory and hasn't, you know, it, it's not bad enough or it hasn't reached that threshold for a diagnosis, cognitive rehabilitation could be more beneficial. It's a much more intensive intervention. And this kind of intervention doesn't necessarily improve like cognitive test scores, but very much so improves people's personal performance on everyday goals. So it's more about sort of maintaining independent living and maintaining functional ability for a longer period of time. And it's really about, you know, helping people to, to remain independent. So, yeah, I guess just adding to, to all of the other messages is that particularly to remember that it's never too late as well as never too early. So even after that point where a person starts to experience changes or be begins to worry or even has a diagnosis, that all of these brain health interventions still apply at that point. Yeah, great. Thanks, Michelle. OK, and so the second question I have then for the panellists is what do you see as some of the challenges and solutions to the area of brain health? So, Sean, I might go back to you for that one. So I think our, our biggest challenge is we don't provide a platform to identify many of these factors for people. So I think, the, um, you know, and when you when you tease that out, some of it is, you know, arming people with the information so that they are aware of you know, that, you know, brain health and the ability for us to invest in our brain health the same as we do in our heart health and, and other things is, is, is important. Um, then we need to follow up as a, as a, as a you know, health care, um, you know, support 
piece in, in, in how we actually help people at the age of 50 in particular. From 50 on, I think, is, is 50 is a crucial point um, in, in that it is a, you know, there is a 20 year period between 50 and 70 that, you know, I would always, you know, try. Yes, you want to be doing earlier. Yes, you always want to be doing later. But there is a key point of time between 50 and 70 where you can make very, very significant gains and you can almost get into a routine that you know is it you know becomes very very beneficial and i don't think we ha we sufficiently invest in identifying and uh, suffi you know sufficiently invest in primary prevention of issues at that age whereby we are identifying you know people knowing their numbers so know your blood sugars know your cholesterol know your blood pressure um, knowing what is the amount of exercise and then providing people with platforms to exercise because actually knowing that you need to do 150 minutes per week you know, you know that is that is one piece of information. But actually, unless you're able to support people in how they can go about that and support people in engaging it, it becomes more of a stress than it is of support to some people. Similarly, we need to incentivize, you know, purchasing of of healthier foodstuffs, healthier diets. We need to, you know, and, and you know, really support people in making correct decisions. And then we also need to, you know, develop a system whereby they can readily feed back to themselves on those positive outcomes that are that are happening, so that they know that what they're doing is paying a dividend. So at the moment, a lot of it, a lot of advice is around giving literature and sort of, you know, educating people, and they have to go out and seek it themselves. But that leaves a large chunk of society, uh, and in particular, it leaves it leaves people whereby you know, their ability to access information themselves and access opportunities for a healthier lifestyle are more difficult. It leaves them behind and they are a higher risk group. So I think that is that is uh, one of our key challenges. And I think therapies and as we, you know, how we develop therapies and work around this brain health piece around new therapies to treat things like Alzheimer's disease. Um, I think, you know, those are those are some of the, the challenges and, and the solutions. But I think a platform and a structure around how we you know, teach brain health, how we measure it, and then how we're able to measure the outcomes from people taking positive lifestyle choices. I think that's, that's a key thing, not just for brain health, but for cardiac health. We haven't actually managed to achieve this for anything. And actually no country, really outside of maybe some of the Scandinavian countries have really managed to achieve, you know, that, that kind of universal assessment piece. Yeah, yeah, because as you say, you know, it's very much a big role for public health there, isn't there? Yeah. Um, so there's the individual, but then there's the society and, and the public health messages that people are getting. So it's it's quite, you know, there's a lot of elements to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Rob, I'll put the same question to you then in terms of some of the challenges and solutions. Thanks, Carol. I think I'll, I'll just follow up on, on Sean's comments there. From a research perspective, I think the one thing that we're really lacking is our, our longitudinal studies where we start with people from a quite early age because you know the onset of, of these diseases in terms of the biology starts a long long time before the symptoms so you know it would be desirable to try and measure people and to get some information before uh, any of that uh, pathology manifests itself and we don't really have that at the moment it would mean getting a group of you know fairly young adults and you know, measuring things like their, you know, their brain, putting in an MRI scanner, taking blood markers, collecting information about their social networks and their nutrition and following them over a long time and seeing, you know, if we can, if we can try and understand some of the influences there. Because some of the issue that we have in research is that a lot of what we do is cross-sectional. And by that, I mean that, that we tend to, you know, look at people with, uh, you know, perhaps the early stages of Alzheimer's and then, you know, ask questions about their lifestyle or, or their, their history, you know, at, at that moment in time. So some of the things that we're looking at could be, uh, they might just be associated with dementia, but they mightn't be causal. So even thinking back to that flight of stairs climbed uh, association with a younger, having a younger brain or a younger brain pad, it could, it could be, that people who are more motivated or they feel healthier already tend to climb more stairs and don't take the escalator. And perhaps that's related to, uh, to having a younger brain. And we can't be sure about the direction of, of what causes what in that situation. So if we had a longitudinal study that, that started early, we could maybe tease out some of those pieces of information. 
there are studies like TILDA which are really getting towards this. So that's the Irish Longitudinal uh, Study on Aging. And they have people from the age of 50 with, with quite good interventions. And I think as that, as TILDA progresses, and um, people in that study get older, we'll start to understand a lot more about the, the kind of the long-term effects. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, this is difficult to do because it, it costs a lot of money. Somebody would have to fund this and the payoff wouldn't be for maybe two or three decades in the future. So it's, you know, just with the way governments work and funding works, it's a, it's something that's, you know, maybe quite difficult to achieve, but that would be, you know, if I had a billion euro, that's the kind of thing that I would do is try and establish a cohort at a young age and follow them up. And the other thing that we might be able to do, uh, you know, if, if we could, again, if I had a billion euro, would be to look at various different interventions at a younger age. So as Sean was saying there, that we don't really have uh, the understanding in place about the changes that we can make in young adulthood or middle adulthood that might then improve the outcomes in older adulthood. Mm -hmm. So those kind of longitudinal interventional studies would be, would be fantastic if we could do them. Great. Thanks, Rob. And Michelle, same question to you about challenges and solutions. Yeah, so similar to the other points as well, I think one of the key challenges is around that availability of interventions and how to encourage people to engage in these sorts of interventions. So, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had a whole suite of interventions available to people where, you know, we know, let's say the Tai Chi is particularly beneficial exercise for the brain. So if people could say, oh, well, I kind of like to try that Tai Chi intervention. I'm not really too mad about that cog rehab one. So, you know, really hopefully in the future we'll be aiming towards trying to have this, you know, a number of different interventions available for people. So I really think that's one of the key challenges is that we know that there are things that help to improve brain health and that there are things that people can do when they have a diagnosis and these kinds of therapies. But it's just around ensuring that we, we continue to try to make these more available in Ireland. Um, and really, I guess, about that public health piece, as you said, the public awareness around helping people to understand how to keep their brain healthy. Um, and the solutions around that, I mean, this webinar series has been hugely beneficial from that point of view in terms of making people aware about the things that they can do. And I think Sean made the point as well about the level of engagement with the webinar series, which has been incredible. Um, and even, I guess, you know, from a personal point of view, We've just been doing work there's there's 27 memory technology resource rooms all over ireland and there's information about those on the, the i think it's the dementia pathways website but those memory technology resource rooms all of the staff in those resource rooms have just completed training with me both in cognitive stimulation therapy and in cognitive rehabilitation and that's only just been done in the past week or so so i think there's there's more demand for for training in these sorts of interventions i've seen a huge level of demand increase you know loads of trainings booked in for the summer so that's a very positive perspective in that there's more awareness from the professional delivery point of view that more people are saying, oh, actually, we need to get trained up on how to deliver these. So from the point of view of those early therapeutic interventions for dementia, I think there will be more availability of these. Um, but, you know, for people attending the webinar, I think it's important to maybe just ask about these things. I think demand will help to improve supply. So I would encourage people to actually, you know, go out and inquire with healthcare professionals or with the Alzheimer's Society around where they can access these sorts of interventions. Yeah. Yeah. And as you say, you know, there has been a lot of interest in this webinar series, which is fantastic. And it does just show the interest in brain health and even the questions that people are asking, you know, people are really engaged and interested in this. So um, there does seem to be a bit of momentum around it. And as you were saying, Sean, you know, it's a concept that we wouldn't have talked about maybe 10 years ago, the, the idea of brain health. So um, it's, it's uh, become more topical than I suppose just the awareness that there are things we can do to keep our brains healthy. Um, so there's a question that's come in about sleep and someone has joined us from Eastern Australia. So you're very welcome all the way from Australia. So sleep seems to be another important, potentially modifiable risk factor through lymphatics, indirect dietary influences, immune regulation, inflammation, mental health, et cetera. Any thoughts? So I might ask Sean um, to maybe respond to that one on sleep. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'd, I'd actually, I'd, I'd be happy to, uh, I'm interested to hear what, so what Rob and Michelle might think. So we know that, um, you know, so sleep dysregulation is is a key, you know, present presenting feature often in people who may have early stage cognitive decline. We know in even conditions such as delirium, which is acute 
confusional states that might happen with you know a medical condition such as an infection you know sleep disorders and, and sleep dysregulation is a is a prominent piece we also know that the only Guinness Book of Records that they banned um, was the longest time spent awake by virtue of the fact that people became abruptly unwell and it caused you know premature death um, so they stopped allowing people to try and, uh, you know, to, to beat that world record. So sleep is a hugely important you know, piece when it comes to our cognitive and brain health and psychological well-being. Uh, I think it's a science that's rapid, that, that's evolving. I think our, our, our understanding of it and the natures of how different zones of sleep, because I suppose the amount of times your eyes are closed does not equate to, you know, if you like the quality of sleep and there's different levels of sleep and in particular, what we call REM sleep, uh, rapid eye movement sleep, which is, you know, that part of where they, a huge amount of uh, regenerative processes within the brain, sorting out, you know, a, a lot of memories and, and a lot of the events that have happened throughout the day uh, and even from the point of view of our dreams and things like that happen during that period of sleep so it's a really it's the shortest period it's the shortest burst of, of that general sleep cycle but a huge amount of importance is attributed to it and we know that disruptions in it are associated with with parkinson's like dementias and other types of dementias in, in particular um, but also we see it as a as a feature uh, or the deterioration in that high quality uh, sleep uh, as a feature of other dimensions as well. But I mean, it is it is more in that research uh, research realm than, than in the clinical dom uh, domain. So I'd be interested to hear what, what Rob and Michelle might have to say. Okay, so Michelle, I don't know if you wanted to add anything there. Yeah, um, I guess just from the point of view of the, 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 the like, what, what can we do to improve our sleep? And I saw another question coming in saying, um, did we recommend any sleep apps? Um, I have a PhD student at the moment looking at the relationship between mindfulness, sleep and cognitive functioning. Now, you know, the, we're still not really clear on the relationship between those factors, but there is some evidence to suggest that mindfulness can help sleep and that mindfulness can improve cognition. But, you know, we're really trying to look at is there a relationship between all three? Um, but from the point of view, just somebody asked there about apps for sleep. Uh, I, I have trouble sleeping myself, so I use an app called Insight Timer. You know, that's not a, a scientific recommendation. It's just a personal one. But there are lots of apps available out there. And the, there's a huge demand for mindfulness around sleep. So a lot of those mindfulness apps will have built in meditations specifically for sleep. Um, there's a new series on Netflix as well. The name of it will come back to me, but it's around using meditation and using mindfulness to help to improve sleep. Okay, very good. Thanks. And Rob, anything to add there? Yeah, just to echo uh, what the previous speakers have said that, that you know, your brain really needs sleep. It needs to restore uh, its functions. And a lot of that happens overnight or when, whenever you sleep that it kind of it repairs itself overnight and consolidates some memories. And I guess it's important to distinguish between poor sleep, maybe due to other medical conditions like apnea that, that could be causing poor sleep. But then there's other things that we can do, like Michelle was saying, like having better sleep hygiene, just to be yeah, aware of, of your routine before you go to bed and not not doing things like you know drinking coffee or you know watching screens until quite late at night that would disrupt your sleep, meaning you don't get the deep sleep that Sean was talking about. And if you miss out on that deep sleep, maybe for even a few nights in a row, you know, you, you will start to slow down a bit cognitively as anybody with, you know, a small child, if you can remember that, uh, will know that, you know, you, you start to lose it after a few days of not getting a good, good quality sleep. So, so whenever you can, it's, I mean, it's good to practice good sleep hygiene and just try and get some good deep sleep, like Sean was saying. Great, thanks. And someone's made a comment there, I think, Rob, in relation to you were talking about the longitudinal research. So her daughter participated in an adolescent brain health study from around 10 to 18 years in Dublin. She's now 24. It included brain MRIs. So it'd be great if something like that could be extended yeah. on <laughs> if we had our yeah. billion euro that you were talking about. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I'm a, I think I know the study that she's talking okay. about. And I'm a PI on it at the moment. That one okay. of the things we're trying to do is to, is to get that cohort, uh, you know, try and get funding to get that cohort, if that's the study I'm thinking of, imaged with a view to using scans that are specifically targeted at brain health and aging to maybe turn that into an aging cohort because we have been following, you know, a, a big study, a 
big group of adolescents, about 2,000 of them from the age of 14. Mm-hmm. You know, my goal would be to try and follow those people as they, as they get older because we have so much information on them. Yeah, great. Um, so a question has come in here, how to treat a depressed person, uh, someone is wondering. So, uh, Sean, I might start with you there in relation to, to that question. Hey, well, I suppose what I would say is I'm not I'm not a psychiatrist, um, a, and probably the best uh, you know point of reference for me to to talk from is is that we would see um, you know many people presenting to our memory services with symptoms of you know where they feel that their memory has declined, but in reality when we tease it out with them, what's happened is is they have reduced attention, so their ability to pay attention or wish to focus on something long enough to take in the information is diminished to such a point that you know they're not they don't take it out they don't take the information in to ever retrieve it uh, and to 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 give it back and in many of those instances are uh, low grade or you know chronic or subchronic depression you know is, is is a feature of that where they have chronically low mood late life depression and and earlier life depression are slightly different you know uh, in 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 if you like many people who get later life depression will also have you know what we call blood vessel disease or vascular disease so it, it is a clinical symptom where, where somebody may have had you know small little subacute strokes but from the point of view of how we treat it well it's, it's you know it is a combination of first of all addressing it uh, informing the person you know that that's what you feel is is, is going on um, and then you know, looking at you know what are the environmental or psychological supports that you can put in place things like counseling and where it's at trying to address red flag issues such as you know whether or not somebody has felt suicidal or whether or not they've you know you know how severe have their symptoms of depression have been how disengaged have they become and are there psychotic elements to it so sometimes people with a severe depression can have hallucinations can have delusions can have you know paranoia that wouldn't be their typical self so trying to tease out those things um and then uh, you know uh, you know, when those things are taken into account, there are medications uh, and different medicines and any medicine, you know, that you're given. I mean, so there isn't a one medicine fits all for any particular scenario, especially when it comes to medicines and the brain, given the nature of our brains being unique and the, and the factors that cause it being unique. So, so psychiatrists or general practitioners with a special interest and training in it would be, you know, best placed if medication is necessary. And if it's a case whereby it's not responding to medication or if it's not responding to the other interventions ahead of medication, well, well, that's, that's, that's a, you know, that would suggest a need to escalate, you know, uh, for, for, one of our psychology or psychiatry colleagues to to be going through things. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Someone's asking here about brain training. Um, What are your thoughts on virtual brain training or other games such as chess? Has any research explored this? Now, I know what, I can't remember, maybe it was Rob, did you mention in your webinar about uh, brain training, the the evidence-based was two? Uh, I don't know if it was you, maybe not, maybe it was yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. Michelle, Michelle may 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 have. We use uh, so Brain HQ from Positive yeah. Science is is yeah. is a cognitive uh, you know training. It's a games platform. It's an on, it's uh, an online games platform. It you know elements of it were used in the active study over in the US, which was a large scale funded study looking at the benefits of of cognitive mm-hmm. training, cognitive stimulation on on um, activities of daily living. And I think that's the key. The other key message is the re- all. All of what we try to do is around having an end product whereby people are able to maintain their activities of daily living. Okay, so all of the scales we measure that are looking at, you know, really it doesn't make a difference if you remember seven items out of a list of 10 items, you know, on, on a brain training test versus five. The, the important thing is your ability to maintain your activities of daily living. The active study looked at you know, different elements of, of cognitive stimulation and how that may, how they may translate into activities of daily living. And certainly, um, you know, by participating in some of these multimodal cognitive stimulation, as opposed to just doing one thing like Sudoku. So I regularly get asked about crossword Sudoku and all of those things. If you just do those, you become very good at those. And there is probably a little dividend, but the most important thing is about actually having multimodal. And digital platforms give us an opportunity for games like um, simulation, a bit like you mentioned about the exercising 
stimulation where there's other things going on around other than just the task you're doing that that you can that there clear, clearly seems to be a dividend for and actually driving is one of those things that there seems to be a dividend for because in particularly exercising visual fields and we're an inherently very visual brain so if you're exercising those components in particular along with memory there seems to be an, a, an additional dividend so Brain HQ would be the one. I don't have any shares in it. I don't have any endorsements with it or anything along those lines. But it, there is there is a reasonable evidence base, independent evidence base around yeah, elements of their program. Yeah, and I'll follow up with that person because I know there was a second one. It was Brain HQ, and I can't remember what the other one was. But I'll, I'll double check so, and I can. So luminosity is luminosity okay. is the other is the yeah. other is is the other um, commonly commonly used program. Yeah, great. Yeah. Thank you some of those brain training some of the cognitive training apps and things like that i think they get a bit of a bad rap in randomized control or in um systematic review and i think it's just because it's very difficult to try to compare the results of such of studies that are so um designed so differently yeah. and the interventions are so different and the outcomes are so different so in general i think if you were to look up a, a systematic review or a meta-analysis the conclusions particularly of some of the cochrane reviews the conclusions around cognitive training would be that there are they, they're not they wouldn't be recommended or that there's you know insufficient evidence to support these but i think it's important then to look at you know a little bit past that and and as, as sean said maybe look at independent evidence around one particular type of brain training like the the brain hq or the luminosity and really what you know as, as picking up another point that sean said is what we're aiming to do with those kinds of that, that kind of brain training is you, you're, you can have either near transfer or far transfer effects. So the near transfer is if you do memory training and you know afterwards your memory improves for the specific kind of train task, that's of minimal benefit really. So what you want to do is engage in some kind of cognitive training that you get that far transfer effect where the effects of the training transfer over onto activities of daily living. So usually if, if the brain training focuses on something like different types of executive functioning or core executive functions, they, they tend to be the ones that, that show more, more fire transfer. But yeah, those, those two, brain HQ or luminosity, could be worth a try. Great, thank you. So there's a question here, why is it that some people that are alcoholics get Alzheimer's and other alcoholics do not? So again, I might go to you first, Sean, on that question. No, I mean, I, I think the uh, this kind of falls into the zone of, you know, why do some smokers go to get lung cancer and other smokers do not? I mean, everybody's brain is, is different. I think cognitive reserve has a part to play in this. And I think Rob mentioned and, and Michelle mentioned about cognitive reserve earlier on. What is absolutely universal is the toxic impact of alcohol on the brain, alcohol to excess on the brain. Um, you know, but, you know, and, and we know that there are specific forms of dementia. I mean, so that person has mentioned Alzheimer's disease and certainly there is probably a heightened risk for exposing the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease um, as in that if you diminish your brain reserve with alcohol, the pathology, so if you like, the proteins that we know build up in your brain over 20 or 25 years in Alzheimer's disease are more likely to clinically express themselves earlier in the context of somebody who's drinking more. So to, is, is that clear? So you're lowering the threshold by which a certain amount of protein. So Rob would have mentioned whereby you can have two brains and um, both can have very similar loads of, of these toxic proteins in them, but somebody may have you know, symptoms of dementia, the other person may not. Alcohol is one of those features that may, you know, certainly tip the balance towards somebody having um, symptoms of dementia rather than not. It diminishes, if you like, your brain health. I think there's another type of dementia, Korsakoff dementia, which is particularly associated with, with alcohol, which is a rapid amnestic type symptom. And we would see, uh, unfortunately, people who would, who would have consumed alcohol to excess would, would present with that type of dementia. And it's often associated with, you know, vitamin um, B deficiency, B6 and B12 deficiency. Great, thank you. So there's a question here from someone in Singapore. So greetings uh, to our Singapore attendees. I'd like to know if there are any resources available on uh, social based activities that would enhance the various functions uh, within cognitive reserve. So can we combine social interaction with cognitive reserve training? So I might put that to you, Michelle. 
Yeah, there's lots of evidence to show that, you know, different kinds of social activities are beneficial for the brain. And, you know, there's a lot of um, interest in kind of studies and lots of reviews that have been done on that even relatively recently. So afterwards, I might post a couple of links and um, maybe into the chat or into the Q&A to follow up on that. But, you know, anywhere, trying to keep your brain healthy, it's all about thinking about, think about engagement. And whether that be physical engagement, cognitive engagement, or social engagement, also. So yeah, being as being social and keeping socially engaged is important. And um, there's different kinds or types of social engagement. So you know, you could have a social activity where you go out to a theater with a friend. Pre-COVID, hopefully we'll get back to that soon. Um, or you could have social support from maybe one close family member. Um, or there would be, could be other kinds of social activities, like maybe calling somebody up on the phone. Um, the research evidence tends to show that things like these sorts of social activities, so getting out and about and socialising, is one of the more beneficial kinds of social activities. And I guess that's probably because it's, you're, it's not just that it's a social activity, but you're also engaging in maybe if you're attending the theatre or even having a conversation with somebody. I would use the example of like gossiping. If you're gossiping, you need to be able to remember lots of information about lots of different people and be able to relay that information. So even gossiping can be good for your brain health. Um, but also having a good source of social support can be really beneficial. So, you know, the number of individuals in your social network doesn't necessarily matter if you have 20 friends or two friends. What's really important is the quality of the social support that you get from the individual. So if you have 20 friends, but none of them give you good social support, you're better off having two friends than you can have that really high level of social, that kind of emotional support. So absolutely, you know, as much as possible, I would encourage combining any kind of cognitive intervention with as much social interventions as possible as well. Okay, great. Thank you. A uh, question here on is, and we've had uh, two questions, I think, coming in on this topic. Is there any evidence or research that people on the autistic spectrum are more prone to developing dementia? So, Rob, I don't know whether you'd have a well, thought on that. Well, I mean, I guess, so, so my thoughts on that would be that something like autism is a, is a category of behaviours, really, that we, you know, it's something that we define in terms of the, the observable behaviour but the, the underlying biology of, of autism, there's many, many different kinds, or at least that's, that's what we think, is it's not clear. It, there's definitely not one biology that gives rise to, to what we call the autistic spectrum of behaviors. Whereas in contrast, something like Alzheimer's is, is reasonably quite well understood what the underlying biology is and, and how it works and what the mechanism of action is. So from that point of view, I don't think that you could you could link the two because one of them is uh, autism or what we call autism, the autism spectrum is driven by lots and lots of different biological factors that will be quite different for different people. You know, that there's many different clusters or causes of it, whereas Alzheimer's is, is much, much more well-defined. So you couldn't get a one-to-one -one mapping between what we call autism or autistic behaviors and something like Alzheimer's. There might be some types of autism that may be, are more biologically related to Alzheimer's, but you, I don't think you could you could make necessarily make a one to one mapping. Okay, yeah. thanks. And yeah, Sean, and, just, yeah. and yeah, no, and just uh, you know, so absolutely, uh, as as Rob said, I think where there is an interesting interplay between the two conditions is in presentation of cognitive of of you know cognitive symptoms later in life so oftentimes some of those behaviors that um, people who are living with autism they manage to actually kind of regulate and manage an awful lot of those behaviors and can be very high functioning and as they may develop mild cognitive symptoms their ability to regulate and manage some of those symptoms in social circumstances as they would have done for the preceding two or three decades can actually maybe decline a little bit and it can mean that somebody who maybe has mild you know, cognitive symptoms all of a sudden presents with you know, strange personality changes or something where actually they were manifest already beforehand, but they were, they were self-regulating and had, had, if you like, developed a means of, of self-regulating and then all of a sudden. And it has, you know, the, the reason why it's worth mentioning is, is because sometimes it's misdiagnosed as a frontotemporal dementia, you know, where people can have, you know, or ascribe these new behaviors where actually they have been pre-existing. And when you, when you peel back and it's why it's so important, the most important diagnostic aid 
when when you know coming up with the diagnosis of, of, of what might be causing a dementia is the story and the history and it's one of those reasons why it's so important for people to go back talk to family members and talk to people who knew somebody with their permission and find out what were those pre-morbid personality types so a frequent if you like potential misdiagnosis of frontotemporal dementia comes where somebody may have a low-grade kind of alzheimer's type you know, phenomenon going on and they're just not able to regulate those pre-existing symptoms where they may have had autistic, ritualistic type, you know, um, you know, uh, personality pieces beforehand. Okay, great. And is there anybody in Ireland who specializes in the treatment of people who would um, have both conditions? Someone's asking that question. No, I mean, we would frequently see people who had pre-existing, you know, um, autism in, in the memory service where they develop new symptoms and things like that. And there are, there are PDI, you know, there are people, you know, who are, who specialize in, in, in supporting, you know, people with autistic um, traits in, in, in early life as well. But there isn't, as Rob said, there isn't a biological, I mean, so there certainly isn't a clearly established biological link between the two. It's really just at the, at the stage whereby somebody might be developing something else. Um, you know, that, that it's worth teasing out. Yeah, great. So someone's asking here, if someone is very smart and highly functioning, but is now noticing changes in memory, do they have to wait for further impairment or is there somewhere they can go to assess this? So Sean, you're um, that is, that is, <laughs> nodding. Uh, yeah. That's exactly the stages at which we want to be seeing people and earlier. I mean, so, you know, so uh, seek out a memory service such as the one we have here in Tala or another lo more local one. And, uh, you know, where we start evaluating. So certainly uh, access where we don't have any, there's no definitive cures. But what I think we're outlining is, is that, you know, there is this whole suite of interventions that are possible and supporting somebody through accessing those brain health interventions. So we have a separate brain health clinic, um, you know, that we operate alongside our memory service here. So we try to support people towards developing their personal prevention plan. Um, so even in the, in the context that we may not be looking at medications, there's a lot we can do. And also we take that stress. So we, we monitor it longitudinally and we're able to kind of keep an eye so that the person themselves know that um, if it is a case where it dips, because we're very, very poor um, at judge, making a judgment on our own memory. Um, one of my much recited lines is you can't remember what you've forgotten. So we're not good at knowing what our memory is when it's poor, but we're also not necessarily good at knowing it when it's good, because some people are very, very perfectionistic and refer, you know, forgetting one or two things you know, almost catastrophizes um, a scenario. So, so I think it is, it is good and useful to have objective measurements and those are certainly uh, memory services would be looking for people with mild memory difficulties. Great. And um, I know this question came up actually in one of the other webinars about getting blood tests to measure the level of proteins in your blood, which can be indicative of potential dementia. So I think, Sean, you might address that one before, but I might ask you to just maybe make yeah. a comment on that. So very quickly, I mean, so we have, it, it is very fast evolving. It's still re in research domain. Um, there are clinically validated tests to do this. I think one of the things that holds it back is that um, it will always probably be a pretest to a more definitive test. So in other words, we can certainly do, you know, there will be the potential, you know, over the next few years to probably have a blood test that will talk about whether or not somebody may or may not have amyloid or, or tau more specifically within their brain, but you will probably always have to follow up with a confirmatory either lumbar puncture, so cerebrospinal fluid test, or a PET scan, which will be looking specifically to see if those proteins are in your brain. So I don't think we're, we, you know, you know, certainly not for the foreseeable future that we will get, but there is, I mean, there is a, a vista potentially over the next few years where by brief memory tests with the blood test will probably really be delineating out um, who needs to come see uh, somebody as a priority in a memory service. And when I say that, it will be people probably in their 50s that that will be detecting because we know that these blood tests are often very positive for many, many years ahead of symptoms. So we're getting into a stage of identifying preclinical cohorts. So before there's any evidence of memory decline. And that's, that's where much of it is going on. You know, the future for managing dementia for, for some people will be very much like we manage cancer right now. It will be identifying early pre-symptomatic, you know, elements of the disease and initiating chemotherapy 
um, you know, when we have those therapies available. But that is that is the ultimate goal. But for now, no, there isn't a blood test. But, but very hopeful. It's a very hopeful message, really, isn't it, for yeah, no, the near future? Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's a question about hereditary or genetic factors. Um, you know, how important are they? Uh, Michelle, I might put that question to you. So this person said they, their dad and two of their siblings experienced dementia. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I might actually um, ask Sean and Rod their opinion on this as well. But, you know, I mean, we know that there's, it's, it's a very, very small percentage of Alzheimer's that has a hereditary aspect to it. So I think we always need to be very cautious when we're, we're, we're sort of talking about this and talking about the hereditary aspect. I think people can, you know, can maybe observe that, you know, somebody in their family had it and then somebody else had it and, and maybe assume that, that, that there might be a hereditary factor there, but, but this isn't often the case. Um, I, I'm not, you know, I don't have an awful lot of knowledge about that. So I might just go over to Robert, Sean, are there around kind of tests that you can do to determine that hereditary factor. Okay, so uh, Rob, did you want to? Yeah, I mean, I think there are certainly some genetic liabilities to developing uh, a disease like Alzheimer's, but I think the important thing, as Michelle alluded to there, to remember is that these are probabilities or risk factors. It's not something like Huntington's where there is a specific gene or, 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 or a repeat in the genetic code that is that will determine the outcome. Really, these are just shifting the odds a little bit in one direction or the other. So if you've got you know, a, really, uh, a really good set of genes versus having a really bad set of genes, it's just shifting the odds, the, the percentage or the probability of developing Alzheimer's. So it's not, it's not deterministic. So even if you got a genetic test and it said, well, you, you know, you've got some risk risky genes here for Alzheimer's. All those other preventable things that we talked about are still totally relevant. And, you know, it's all about uh, shifting the odds. So I, you know, there's no, unless it's a very specific type of Alzheimer's that's you know really heritable in general, there's no, you, you can't really get a genetic test and say, okay, this is definitely going to happen or this is definitely not going to happen. Yeah. It's not strongly genetic. Yeah, about about two percent of or the people that we would see with Alzheimer's disease have a you know have one of those dominantly or you know inherited types of Alzheimer's disease, and I suppose especially where we would see there be a cluster of younger relatives, you know who may have you know who may have previously had Alzheimer's. That's where we would where we would look to see whether they have what you know the 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 classic um, gene mutations would be presenilin one and two and APP or amyloid precursor protein where we look for those kind of particular genes. So it's very rare in Alzheimer's disease. It's slightly more common in frontotemporal dementia. So in frontotemporal dementia, we might look and f identify a genetic cause in maybe one in five or so people with uh, frontotemporal dementia. But yet again, you wouldn't be necessarily looking at familial tracking, but it just shows that there is a genetic link that is directly associated to the protein that builds up in the brain. So we would see a, a gene that directly increases, the, the if like in, in an FTD that increases tau or in Alzheimer's disease that increases amyloid. Um, the, the other, the main genetic risk factor that we talk about in, in, in dementia is APOE. And, and that is, you know, exactly as, as, as Rob and Michelle alluded to, is, is more of a risk that is a, an, an adjustment. It's risk factor rather than a direct impact piece. It may become, as we understand more about it, it may come more into focus when we're doing the brain aging, you know, when we're doing brain aging exercises and we're trying to feed information, it is a piece of information that is very valuable and it does highlight a risk. But as it stands at the moment, we don't routinely look for it, um, you know, uh, in clinics. Okay, great, thank you. And there's a question here about the proteins in our brains. So those toxic proteins that um, we were talking about earlier, uh, do we all have these proteins in our brains? So um, Sean, I might go to you to, answer that one as well yeah so i mean it's it's a it's a very good it's a very good question and yes to a certain extent as everybody's brain grows older in particular tau is a protein that accumulates in the brain okay not everybody though will accumulate amyloid and, and certainly rob and michelle will be able to to correct my science on this but what we kind of understand is that those people who have amyloid accumulating in their brain it alters that tau 
and makes it into a more toxic form. And it's the accumulation of that, what we call peak tau or phosphorylated tau, that is directly responsible for the shrinkage in the parts of the brain that are important uh, and for the memory symptoms as they unfold. So if you like, amyloid is, 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 is you need tau and you, you know, which most of us Will, will develop as we age. Amyloid then is, is, is the protein that comes in that some of us will develop as we age. And it's the main protein associated with Alzheimer's disease. And the presence of amyloid then, if you like, creates this toxic form of tau, which then has the impact. That's, that's generally my understanding. Okay, yeah. So I don't, but, but it would be good to, to hear the, the actual experts. <laughs> <laughs> so Michelle or Rob, did either of you want to uh, add anything to that? No, I don't have too much to add. I think Sean's explanation was, was <laughs> yeah. perfect. Yeah, but I mean, I think it's, you know, again, it's not uh, the the pathology is not, you know, one-to-one -one mapping with behavior that, you know, some people will have some pathology and, you know, uh, these proteins, but they may not have any, you know, any outward behavior or even just very mild. So. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so um, there's a question about, is there a connection between motor neuron disease and dementia? And it kind of relates to that question we've just addressed there. So uh, again, Sean, I might uh, ask you that question. Yeah, so our, our Trinity colleague, Orla Harleyman, is, is, is a world authority on this. But yeah, one of the things we have uh, understood over the last decade or so, well, possibly even slightly longer than a decade, is the association between, in, in particular, frontotemporal dementia and motor neuron disease. And uh, frontotemporal dementia is caused by, you know, is a dementia that affects both the, the frontal lobes and the temporal lobes at the side. And what we know is that the buildup in particular of tau, but there are also other protein types, including one called uh, TDP43, which can cause, you know, um, a, you know, a frontal, you know, that cause frontotemporal dementia. So slightly different proteins to the proteins that cause, they are different proteins actually, definitively different proteins to the ones that cause Alzheimer's disease in many respects. And we know that there is a genetic association between motor neuron disease and this dementia, whereby certain people who have, who have a, in particular, a genetic defect on chromosome nine, but also other chromosomes can have this clustering of both motor neuron disease. And some people will present with the frontotemporal dementia and then develop motor neuron disease and some people can present with motor neuron disease and then develop these dementia symptoms. So yes, there is an association between motor neuron disease and cognitive symptoms. Even in the absence of frontotemporal dementia, there are some cognitive symptoms that we know are associated with motor neuron disease and subtle, subtle cognitive uh, symptoms associated with it as well. Yeah, okay, great, thanks. And so I don't know. I mean, yet again, yeah. I mean, I don't know whether Rob or Michelle might might know a bit more. It's it's not certainly my exact area of. Yeah, me neither. Now I, I don't know enough to to comment on those links. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> okay, but I, I think that that was a pretty comprehensive uh, answer there. So hopefully that will have addressed that that particular question. And I know we've had some questions coming in specifically around nutrition. So we're going to run another webinar next Monday and our nutrition expert, Dr. Catherine Hughes from Ulster University is going to be on that. It's going to be the same format that kind of ask the experts. So um, hopefully if those people could log on next week and certainly if there's any specific questions that you want addressed, feel free to email me. Um, so you can email info at dementianetwork.ie and I'll try and, and get answers for people um, because it looks like uh, we've run out of time now for um, more questions. So I'm just going to uh, show you, uh, sorry now, just get my presentation up here in terms of next week. Uh, nope, that's not working either. Okay, I, I don't have much luck with technology this morning. Um, so next week we're going to run, so that's Monday the 31st, we're going to run our second Ask the Experts webinar series, as I was just saying there. And it's going to be the same time, 11 o'clock to 12.15. And uh, the details are on the Eventbrite site that you all book through, so you can book tickets for that. And it's going to be, again, the other speakers from our webinar series um, that will be joining us for that. And um, so just want to thank uh, all our panelists this morning. So Professor Sean Kennelly, Dr. Robert Whelan and Dr. Michelle Kelly. Uh, thanks very much for answering all the, the questions that were fired at you today. And thanks very much to all our attendees today. As I said, it was great to see the interest in, in brain health and hopefully you'll be able to join us next Monday as well. And have a good day.
Thanks very much. Bye now. Bye now. Bye. Bye everyone.